Father, we come to you this morning to thank you for the many blessings you give to us and for your constant, unfailing love. I pray that you would be with our church as we continue to get the different areas of our ministries up and running, that you would guide each leader of each ministry as they continue to work and push forward. I ask that you would be with Dan as he teaches this morning and that we would all focus on the message you have for us today. In your mighty name, amen. Well, welcome to everybody. Uh, some new faces that I haven't seen, so welcome to all of you and everybody online. Um, I am so, so excited about the thing that we launched. Uh, we talked about it first in November, and uh, we're launching it, uh, a restart, if you will, of our children's ministry first. And if you have not seen what has taken place in the children's area back there, you have to. Um, Sabrina and team, job well, well done. The problem when you have somebody do something that exceeds your expectations, all these other ministries, the bar is now here. I can't even reach that high. So Sabrina and company have just done a phenomenal job. And to that end, um, in three weeks from today will be the official relaunch of the children's ministry. So I am encouraging parents out there in uh, internet land, as well as everybody here, bring your kids. Grandparents, bring your grandkids. If you don't have kids to bring, go down the street and grab some neighbor kids. <laughs> bring them in. There's going to be a lot of excitement with the new program, with the um, uh, course that... Uh, or Boz? Boz the Bear. Boz the Bear. So um, there is still opportunity for all of you to get uh, involved in a ministry. We are ratcheting this up. I mean, you can tell the music is, is off in a whole nother land. It's going great. Uh, the sound back there, Alan, is just really doing a great job. So everything is ratcheting up. We're trying to take everything to the next level and we would like for all of you to be a part of some ministry, um, be a part of more than one. So Sabrina and I talked a little bit this morning. We're going to try and get the uh, children's uh, ministry. She's going to talk with Alan and Colony. I think you're and, and your mom are doing the Facebook page. So we're going to want to work with Sabrina to start promoting that so that we have this place just fill with little critters all over the place. Is that what you call kids these days? I don't know you. Anyways, um, so, and then uh, we're going to be working on a few other things, uh, men's and ladies' ministries, uh, just all kinds of things. So we encourage you to take part of this. And again, if you haven't seen it, please, before you leave today, go all the way back and look at what has been done in the children's area. It's still, it's, it's started. Yeah, it's not completed yet. But she will. Ha she assures me she will have it all done by the time we kick off on uh, April fourth. Is the official relaunch. So, Sabrina, again, could I get everybody just to thank her again? Just a tremendous job. Okay, uh, Dan. Oh, is he? So, well, Bo's in ER right now. I just found that out. Is, uh, I think he's going to be fine. He's going to be all right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> wow. What a shocker. You just get it just before I came. Oh, by the way, Dan Bo's in the hospital. What? Yeah. Why'd you like to know that? <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just before I come up. Um, I'm glad everybody's here. I hope you've had a, a decent week. Um, I've been busy. Which is not a bad thing. I, it, it's, it's nice, though, to know people like Alan when you have issues like your a hot water heater going out at uh, uh, a building that I have out in Mount Vernon. And that was fun to watch him fix it because I didn't, I didn't know his little tricks. It was pretty good tricks. Pretty good. Um, Lots going on in your world. This is exciting to me. I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, we're actually moving forward with stuff. That's, uh, I need the encouragement. I need the motivation. 
Um, we've already been prayed in. And I don't think I need to do it again. I was back there praying. By the way, I, it's funny. I, I observed that some of you were actually moving to the music and getting into it and enjoying the worship. Now, I'm not saying those that weren't moving around weren't worshiping because I sometimes stand and just listen to worship. But I was paying attention to Alan and me in the back. And it was actually funny if you can see it because we're wiggling all over the place back there, really enjoying it. So. I expect to see you all wiggling out here. <laughs> uh, let's get started because I want to cover some ground and I'm hoping that, um, that I do this effectively. I really want to do this justice. We've been looking at praise, what praise is. We started last week looking at what true worship is. And just a quick recap, I said to you last week that um, if you go listen to pastors preach on the subject of worship, they, they get some of it. And that's the thing I want you to focus on. Worship is far greater than what I do. Nothing. Can, My camera just stopped working. Went out. What did you do? I didn't do anything. <laughs> so the, um, that's all right. I, if I can be heard, that's okay. Maybe they shouldn't see me. Because I'm going to be moving around a lot up here, like I normally do. Um, the, the, the confusion is, and, and it's not, I don't even want to call it confusion. You're going to see today, we're going to be looking at the name of God, his personal name. Not all the names defining his characteristics, but his personal name, Yahweh. But what I want you to understand is you cannot, it is impossible to fully define the fullness of worship. That's why, and, and again, I'll show you today, that's why <clears throat> anything, and believe it or not, anything that we offer up as worship or see as worship is not, it's less than the fullness of it. Uh, it's like I told you, Oh, uh, one of the professors at Dallas Theological Seminary asked his students on the first day, how many of you believe that you have perfectly worshiped God? And of course, some were smart enough not to raise their hands, others raised their hands, and he goes, well, I haven't. And the reason for that is, is because you only can worship to the point that your flesh will allow you to worship or the level, believe it or not, and don't think too hard about this because you'd have to take a lot more time than now to think this through, the level that you're subjecting yourself to the movement correctly of the Holy Spirit in your life. So the idea of perfect worship only can be found in Jesus himself. That is perfect worship. Christ is perfect worship, okay? So I'm gonna walk you through a lot of info. Um, and again, my hope is, is that, you know, that God will give you the ability to see clearly what I'm saying, because I can't fill in all of the spaces. There's too much. Genesis to Revelation is about the worship of God. Everything you see is about the worship of God. Every rock Air, everything is about the worship of God. So I can't fill in all the spaces, but I hope I can give you the sense of it uh, as we start to get into it. I wanted to title this, I Am, uh, and then I thought, well, I could do the study of worship. So I think I Am is easier to write out when we title it, but we're going to be looking at that. Now, I got to build a premise for you to help you get going in the right direction. So the question you would have to ask yourself is what is in a name? What is in a name? It is in our very nature, God given to name things and to name animals and to name people. Remember he told Adam to name all the animals. There's a reason why he told them told him to name the animals. It was to identify those animals as being his animals. Those are your animals, Adam. You name your animals. You name your dogs, your cats, 
Some people name their cars. We definitely name our boats. I had a boat once I named Navica, which is little boat in Latin. Um, you name your children. And there's the one I want you to just kind of hone in on a little bit. You take time to think through what name most of you do. <laughs> you want to name your child. My name's Danny or Daniel, which means God is my judge. My last name is Reed, which means red, ruddy, or bird hunter. There's a reason for those names. And you see in England, they'll do their crests and their, the, the family names identified in symbols. And, but when you, when you name a child, that child comes from you and your spouse. And you name that child and that child takes on the name of the family. Are you with me? I see, I get giddy about this stuff already because I know where I'm going. <laughs> That's the hard part. I want to jump ahead. When you get married in its right context, you can go all the way back to Adam and Eve. And Adam is called man. And then he gets called Adam or Adam. And then Eve shows up and the communication is, is this is woo man made from me, comes from me is what Adam was saying, bone of bone, flesh of my flesh, meaning a, a, a part of me. And then he names her Eve, which means mother of all or mother of everything. Okay. Names matter. You had Jacob, which meant deceiver. God changed his name. You have Name changes, Paul, who, you know, was Saul, you have, which is Greek, right? I know the changes, but you have this movement, Peter, you are now rock, is who I meant to give you. But, so, there's a reason for names. If you do a name study in your scripture, and Bernard had done this for us a number of times, you can actually see that a series of names literally say something that is in reference to scripture. So you'll look at this series of names of these children and then you, you put them together in their meanings and it will literally be a sentence. It's fascinating. <clears throat> so names matter. Last week I showed you this. Now, Alan, go ahead and bring, uh, this is what I left off with and we're going to start with this. Revelation 22.4. <clears throat> Is that not working at all? Oh, no, I got it. Oh, I thought maybe we totally lost all of it. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Now, that's talking about us. Now, don't get ridiculous and try and figure out, well, is he going to tattoo it on my head? Is, is it a laser print? Look, all of that represents to you and you need to worry about is you will be known as God's, his, his name will be on you, okay? Remember I said those names matter and they identify who you are, where you came from, who you belong to, all of that. Take me to number 627, please. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Amazingly enough, the, and I could do a whole sermon on this alone. There is a blessing that comes to an individual who has the name of God on them. You are blessed. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel. My people. My people, he calls us. Jesus refers to us as his church. I'll do like John MacArthur and I'll grab my podium and that way I don't move. <laughs> Second Chronicles 714. If my people who are called by my name, now you're going to read that and go, well, I want to get to the humble themselves and pray and seek my face because that's where normally preachers go to preach. But don't miss what he just said. If my people who are what? 
You are called by his name if you're a believer. Do you understand what that means? Do you know that if I walked around and said that my father was the owner of, I don't know, everybody I think of is a negative thought, (laughs) Uh, McDonald's or the owner of IBM or if I said that, you're going to go, oh, that's your dad? We know for a fact that, for instance, Caesar's slaves would walk down the streets of Rome and they were identified by Caesar as being his slaves. So you would have seen them walking by and gone, oh, that's one of Caesar's slaves. That's one of his people. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal from heaven and will forgive their sin. And by the way, remember sin it literally means to miss the mark and heal their land. So we're seeing a pattern here of God saying about us in Israel, in this case Israel, but it's us too, that we are his people and we are called by his name. It's like I said jokingly, and I meant no disrespect in it when I said it, but it's almost like Dan Yahweh, meaning Dan and my father is God. It's like when I was growing up, my dad's name was Art, Art Reed. My name is Dan Reed. Oh, you're the son of Art Reed. In Jesus' day, when Jesus confer or said that uh, God is his father, literally to the Jewish people, that was a form of blasphemy because in the Jewish culture to say that God is your father is to say that you are God, which Jesus did say. He even used the phraseology, I am. So it's not some flighty, just cavalier concept of naming. It has great value and great importance. Amazingly enough that, you know, the, the uniting of Adam and Eve or the uniting of a man to a woman, and we used to see this as being um, an honored tradition, we used to recognize the value of saying the name in a marriage ceremony and then attaching the female to the male's name. And if things were good or right, he would honor her and respect and love her and care for her and keep her. And she likewise would honor and care. And the name caused them to become one. You have the name of God on you. If you're a believer, you see Jesus talk about the oneness in John 17 between man and And the Godhead, the Trinity, Jesus says, I am in them, they are in me, I'm in you. We are, and he talks about the oneness. As a matter of fact, the word one in the Hebrew means unity. So you need to understand when I speak of the name of God, his personal name, and talk about him putting his name on you, it is no small thing. And the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17 is no small thing. You as believers tend to not un- to understand who you actually are, which causes us, me included, causes us to forget that we represent a family, that we're not just individuals, but as Christians with God's name, we are related now and we are family. Yahweh. It's written out, um, which is what's called, and it's just a big word, but I'm going to give it to you for fun for those of you that like to look things up. It's a te- tetragrammation. Y-H, and I'm going to give you a little technical info. Y-H-W-H. 
Simply, that word I gave you means four letters. That's basically what it means. <clears throat> there are no there are no vowels. The vowels are what would be assumed or they would be um, implied. Now there, and I, again, I'm going to try real hard not to get ahead of myself because I get excited when I get to this point. Because if I move too fast, you're going to miss out some, on some of the good stuff. There's a reason why the Hebrew people would write words, especially God's name in scripture, to where the vowels are implied. It's to protect the true name of God. Man, I'm getting emotional. To protect the true name of God and the word of God from, and we're going to look at this, blasphemy. A Jewish person, a Hebrew, would know the name of God. So if you look at what translators have to deal with when they translate, they have to know the context to properly translate what is written in the manuscripts because the vowels are implied. Meaning if you were Jewish, you had heard the word of God spoken in your community repeatedly. So you knew that that was talking about this. So you knew what vowels would be in there. Let me give you, um, let me give you a little more here because I do want you to understand this. The right way to actually say the word Yahweh, nobody knows. The argument is by the bulk of the scholars out there that it is pronounced Yahweh. But it's also, if you want to say it with um, close, not close enough, it's Yoda Vahe, Vahe or Yoda Wahe. And each one of those letters in that four have a meaning. So if we have in place the rules of pronunciation that they had in place at the time that it was said, then hopefully we're close to getting it right by saying it sounds like Yahweh. I'm willing to argue it doesn't. And I'll show you why. <clears throat> they wanted to protect it. And again, I'll get to that and show you that. They instead... Um, well, here, I'll show it to you now. I'll give you a, yeah, go ahead. Alan, can you jump and take me to Leviticus 24, 16? I'll just show you now. Everybody misunderstands the word blasphemy. Everybody thinks it's a cuss word or whatever, but whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him. The sojourner, meaning even if they're not one of us, as well as the native, when, they, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. Here's what happened in Israel. Most people don't know this. This was put into place by them because people started saying the name of God wrong. You have to understand that when they wrote the name of God, I said this last week, as they started to write it, if they stop in the middle of writing it, the document has to be utterly destroyed and they have to start over. They change pens. They wash a certain way. I mean, it was a fearful thing to say God's name incorrectly or even write it wrong, even the word of God. See, that's why people don't understand that when we talk about how the Jews were masters at maintaining a history People don't understand that in their culture, they were God's people. The name of God was on them. They had a responsibility to the word of God, and it had to be absolutely concise. So none of it would be lost. Okay? 
so you see them being told, okay, you better not say his name wrong. It's blasphemy, his personal name. So they shifted to starting, instead of saying his personal name, they would say Elohim, which is Lord, most high, supreme one. So it got to where the people, you can take that one down if you want, Alan. It got to where the people were afraid to say it, and it actually became the norm for only the high priest to say it one time a year in the Holy of Holies. And everybody else would just go to Elohim and avoid saying the personal name of God. There is so much discussion on really what it was. It's almost as if, and I'm only saying this me, it's almost as if, and this is not biblical, this is just my thoughts. It's almost as if God didn't want us to be able to say it correctly anymore because we do blaspheme his name so severely. Just me now. I see evidence of how he fixes this problem. But I find it fascinating that Israel got to the point that it was like, you don't, you don't say that name, and if you write it, you don't put in any vowels. They didn't start doing the vowel thing. I think, uh, I think they're called the monozorets or something like that in the, like the 6th century. They didn't start doing the vowel thing until later on, and quite frankly, I don't agree with it. It's not going to send you to hell, but there is a reason. Now, one of the believed reasons was, number one, they didn't want anybody to, they left the vows out, they were assumed, or um, was, they didn't want anybody outside of the people of God to say it wrong. So they knew the word of God. Remember, Jesus said to the woman at the well, and we were going to look at that again later, the day is coming where you will worship me in spirit and truth. And he said, the Jews worship at the temple. You worship on the mountain. And he makes a statement in the text. You guys don't really know the truth, but the Jews do. And so they were guarding the name of God and guarding the word of God, because if you were not Jewish or been trained or grown up in the dialect of the Jewish people, you had to work really hard to know what that word was. You're all quiet. I was impressed with it all, too, when I started learning it. It's cool. Psalm 138.2, Alan. I bow down towards your holy temple and give you thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For if you have exalted above all things your name and your word. See how serious they were about it? You have exalted above everything your name and your word. Exodus 3. 14, 15. We're going to go into it now. There's Yahweh. I am who I am. There's his name. Now, again, the scholars have really struggled throughout history to explain that. They give you their ideas, their opinions, their views. They do tremendous amounts of legwork, but they all admit it's their best effort to explain what it means when it says, I am who I am. And then he says to them, and we'll come back to this because I'm not going to leave you hanging. Say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you, meaning Moses you go to them, and when they ask, well, you know, who are you, and what are you doing here? You say to them, I am sent me. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, to help them understand, 
God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, which is Adonai or Elohim, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the mighty one, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. I am, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. We can stop now. No, we can't. I am. Take me to Isaiah 52, 6. Therefore, my people shall know my name. You're going to know someday his name. You're going to really know it. Not what scholars have struggled to identify but you will eventually know it. It's going to be written on your head. Don't know if it really is written on your head. That could be a symbolic. Therefore, in that day, they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. Am I? Okay. Get ready. I am. The best arguments they've come up with is, I will be what I will be. I am all that exists, is, and shall be. I like this one the best because it fits correctly. I am, meaning beyond comprehension. The mysterious, too mysterious to grasp. I am beyond your ability to even comprehend That's why when I say worship is muted because you do not yet know him fully and completely as he is, which hinders your ability to fully and completely worship. He is beyond your comprehension. God is telling Moses, here's my name. I am. There is no identifier. There is no word for my name. Are you with me? I can't be identified by a man saying Yahweh. That's going to identify, but it's it's not who I am. I'm more than that. I'm beyond a word. I'm more than a word. I get a kick out of it. I am. The very present one. Another great view of it is he causes, he causes. Now we actually sang it in one of the songs today and I didn't know you guys were doing it. Go to Isaiah 45, one. It was one of the lines in one of the songs. People don't like what I'm going to show you unless they really know God. If they know God, then they are not bothered by it. They accept it as his glory and respond as God being holy, and I'll show you the verse that people don't like. Thus says the Lord to the anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, catch that, who's in charge, to subdue the nations before him, to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him, that gates may not be closed. Next, I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is none other besides me. There is no God I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know for the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. That's the verse people don't like. 
because you have false teachers that try to tell you that everything going on out there is God trying to make you happy. No, there's a greater plan of God. God loves you and he desperately wants to bless you, but there is a plan of God out there that involves darkness and light, goodness and calamity, and he takes responsibility for it. You see it also in Job where he says at the end of, the jo- of Job, I did these things to Job. He says it. You got a problem with that scripture or that scripture? Your problem is with God, not me. But you need to understand that he is the almighty and that his plan always is to bring glory to his name, his holy name. His goal is to bless you by you worshiping him in his full glory. The blessing is in the fact that the day is coming that you will fully and completely be able to worship him because you were created to worship, not judge him. Okay? I am the Lord who does all these things. Bang. Boy, that hurts. Go on, let's do more. Let's see what else we got, Alan. <laughs> Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death in all Congress. So and we looked at that earlier. Did I give you any more of Isaiah? That's all right if I didn't. Okay, we're good. Okay, so we struggle to find comprehension. We struggle to, um, we speculate a lot. That's what amazes me about us as believers. Um, I do it. I have to do it. You need to know that no pastor you listen to, uh, I'll give you an example. I do it all the time. We'll go to look at names in the Bible and I just avoid them and go past them. And there's always people that try to say the name that they're reading there in the English language. What people and what causes me problems is I know that the English language is not properly pronouncing the name in its original language. So I get to a point, it's like, why bother saying that name? I'm going to say it wrong anyway. Yet some people think that because they've articulated it better in the English language that they're getting it right. No, you're not. That's why, that's why I look at it and I'm thinking, there's no way to the best of the ability of a pastor, aside from, I don't want to go too far down this road because we'll get back to it to some degree. I can only do my best to tell you who God is and what his holiness is. I can only do my best. Now there's a secret to all of this. You're going to love it. And again, I don't want to jump ahead, but don't forget that you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. So there's something else there that I haven't brought up yet. And I don't want to bring it up yet. Because I don't, I, w- I want to keep going. Alan, give me Philippians 2, 9 through 11. I want to see that one again. And that one, can't, I got real early this morning, and I can't remember why I went there. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed him. Oh, now we're Jesus. Bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father, Yahweh. Okay, that's why I don't know where that came from this morning. Good one. The pronunciation rules are an issue. Okay, now, I gave you Leviticus 24, 16, where I told you that it was sacred. Now, again, I'm going to give you some more, and then we'll, we'll start moving towards wrapping up. I may take a little more time today, but you need to hear this. At least I think you do. <laughs> So I started doing a study of linguistics as I was writing this. And it became fascinating to me what I found. And I was talking to Mark Tyler about it this week. And he's over there now taking notes because he had fun when we started looking at it. Those of you who understand linguistics, you probably have heard of frick. I can't, I got to say it right. Frick at, fricative speech. Now, fricative speech is real simple. The letter F or the is an example of fricative speech. It means that there is friction or a a resistance, your teeth, your tongue, the muscles in your vocal cord, your lips. That's all that form of speech. (laughs) This is going to be great. And what they call this is um, 
it's it's uh, what's the word? It's voiced. It's it's voiced sound. Okay, so that's part of how we talk. You will find that one of the sounds that's in the name, not Yahweh, but the original Hebrew writing of the name of God, one of the sounds is in every single language on the planet that they've traced, used in every single language. I found that fascinating. Now you have what is called the, and I'd never say this well, it's the glottal, is that correct? It's, it's, there's a, there's a muscle in your, in your throat or in, in here that when you eat, it moves and lets the food go to your stomach instead of into your lungs. And then it moves to let air go into your lungs. And okay. So, so you have this, it's, it's a, it's a break that happens. So like the word, uh, you're using that muscle, uh, to do that. Okay, so that again is you have another part of you that is causing a, a, a movement from you, let's say. Then you have what's called, and I, this is cool, unvoiced sound. It's called the silent region of speech. It's called assumed sound. Remember, the vowels are assumed. And, come on, this is going to be fun, guys. You got to listen to this. It's, it's not sound that's created by your lips, your mouth, your teeth. When God breathed into Adam, it was the breathing mark of God. Do you remember what that sound was? <sighs> that's unheard sound. That's that sound without any restriction. So the Hebrew language, it's not Adam, because we're doing the break. It's Ada. It's Abraham. It's Sarah. Come on, they gotta give you chills. It's it's unspoken. It's God breathed into Adam. And there's that God connection to Adam. No, no, it, it's God. And so God gave us his name and Israel got to the point where they're like, listen, if you don't say this name right, don't say it all. And they're like, well, you know what? Let's just not say it. Let's just call him Lord. It's that name you don't know fully and completely yet. The best thing you've got is Jesus. But you haven't seen Jesus in his full glory yet. I hope y'all got a kick out of that. I did. I think God does that stuff to us on purpose, just to mess with us. When God saved you, you became his. I honestly believe that breathing mark is already on you. That unspoken word that is God, because it's beyond the ability to put into words. It simply has to be because it's more than anything else you'd ever do or say. Take me back to, now, take me back to John 4.21. Now, when I started, leave it up there, when I started studying, and I, I can't quit, I'm actually addicted to it right now. Um, as a matter of fact, I've been bothering a lot of people a lot wanting to talk about it because literally I I'm, I'm, can't wait to get up to get back into searching the universe in essence for God worship, the worship of a true God, our God, true worship. And it's, it's, it is addictive. Um, I've been kind of in a party mood. But the good side of it came about after I realized I can't worship him. Not really. I don't worship him. Not really. Not really. I'm not, I do not put the level of reverence on God I should put on God. I do not give him the level of respect I should give him. I sin against him. I miss the mark on a daily basis. I, I 
deliberately and willfully at times choose not to worship him and, and violate his holiness and his glory. So it was very convicting as I started looking at worship. And I started realizing, oh, no, <laughs> I'm in trouble. And then you start doing that thing where it's like, well, maybe I really should just quit. Maybe I should just quit ministry. Maybe I should just go fishing. And then put it back up, Alan, please. And then we get to this again. And this is critical, important. And I had never in all the years I've read this, I didn't grasp it, not fully. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Next, please. If you can. You worship what you do not know. Remember I said the Jewish people protected the name of God. They protected the word of God. They were the ones who had been given the revelation. They were the ones God chose for no other reason than God chose for them to be the ones that the Messiah comes through. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we know. Meaning, Jesus, I'm a Jew. We worship what we know is true. For salvation is from the Jews. Next. Here's the good thing that has happened. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking these type of worshipers. See, seeking people to worship him. He's looking for a specific group of people that will worship him in spirit, meaning from yourself. That's not a large S, that's a small S. Large S is always Holy Spirit. You will worship in spirit, meaning from you, like I said last week, and you will worship in truth. Well, that's what had perplexed me. How can I worship in truth if I'm looking at a translation of the original Hebrew language and all the scholars out there struggle to make sure they get the best translation of each and every word. And in some cases, they have to say, this is our best at looking at this. Now, people get upset about that and think I'm saying the word of God is not the word of God. You are wrong. I believe very firmly that the original manuscripts are absolutely perfect and concise. And I can back that with great evidence as one of them being the Jewish people were terrified of saying a word or the name of God incorrectly. So the original writings are absolutely spot on the word of God solidly. Translations struggle to give you the word of God accurately. That's why some translations are better than others. That's why some translations should be thrown in the trash because what happens is the individuals try to insert into it what they want it to say instead of being honest and saying they're not sure what that says, but this is what we have as our best argument. People don't study translation. Instead, they listen to pastors and people try to tell them that their translated Bible is absolutely perfect. It is in its context. But you've got to understand that the word of God is so beyond our little babble and our religious dogmas and our our denominationalism. It's so beyond it. The name of God is more than the name of God. It's bigger than that. Are you with me? It's more. And then I saw that. Am I worshiping God in truth? How? How am I worshiping in truth? I'm not telling you not to read your Bible. I believe very firmly in studying your Bible. It's the word of God. You have to understand, I'm not saying it isn't. I am saying, though, it's a translation. And he's looking for people that will worship him from within and in truth. True worshipers. I got your attention. Take me to Romans 8, 19, please, Alan. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. 
For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, groaning inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, helps us in our weaknesses. Oh, what? For we do not know what to pray. People have messed this verse up so bad so many times. We don't know what to pray. Do you think when you say, dear Lord, God, Yahweh, that you're actually saying his name correctly? You really think that? Do you think that when you speak to him in prayers, that you are speaking perfectly according to his word? No, you can't. But look, the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. You're out of it. You're out of it. I heard a pastor say it today about repentance. Repentance. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that saved you. It's not the level of your feeling repentant towards your sin that saves you. It's not your feelings that save you. It's the blood of Christ that sa- he saved you. It's not your words that make him rever- or honor you or give you the ability to give him reverence. It is him. It's It's not your power or your might or your energy or anything you produce, words, actions, emotions. It is Christ, Christ alone. You're not doing anything other than acknowledging that God has redeemed you and saved you and that he is your Lord of Lords and that he is, I am, beyond your words beyond your thoughts. It's the reason why he said to us, you all think I'm too much like you. He's not. Our movement is to worship by responding. And I have found the missing element in most worship is a lack of humility. And in most cases, people think that because they worship God a certain way, that somehow they've obtained correct worship. Listen, when he told Israel to build that temple, and he told those priests, when you go into that Holy of Holies, you better do every single thing exactly the way I say it, or that priest is going to go in there, and when he walks into the Holy of Holies, he dies. So it's serious. You're not going to meet the mark, but oh my goodness, what's that? The Holy Spirit indwells you, doesn't he? Dwells me. Who's interceding for you with the right words? Who's saying what you're saying to the best of your ability through your words and your actions and your motives, which motives are everything? Who intercedes for you and says it exactly the way it needs to be said? I love it. He intercedes for me. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit. Capital S again. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints. There you are now. You're a saint. You're not the Spirit. Capital S, capital S. He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Really, that means that when you're seeking God, this is the cool thing. You may be saying everything incorrectly in your prayer and asking for all the wrong things. But you're saved by Jesus' work, not your work. And God has a plan for your life and a will for your life. And he will hear you according to his plan and his will for your life. You see it? According to the will of God. He's in charge of it. He's in charge. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Meaning, guess what? Even if you botch it, 
and your prayer is just stupid or your request is, I like this one, Lord, if you let me win the lottery, I'll give you half the money. What is that? But look, God's got to go, okay, I understand. What you're really saying to me is you're greedy and you think you're going to con me into thinking that if you give me half the money, I'm going to help you win the lottery. But Dan, the lottery is not in my plan for you. And I've already provided for you what you need. So here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to keep demonstrating to you that all your needs are met in me, not the lottery. Now that's intercession. Because we'll say stupid things to him. I have. I don't know about you all. I think I say a lot of stupid things to him. I preach a lot of stupid sermons too. Okay. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those, not because of you, because of him, because of the spirit interceding. All things work for good. You had nothing to do with it. Now, granted, if you're willfully sinning, any good father who loves you, who has his name on you, is going to discipline you for your good, not because he wants to hurt you. But look, for those who are called according to his purposes, you could say according to his name. Come on. Isn't that cool? Yes, Dan, that is really cool. <clears throat> so take me back again, and this is it, Revelation 22.4. The day will come, you will see his face, and you will be called. Do you see that? It's all, it's all perfectly placed. You are, I am Dan Reed, a child of whatever his name is, really. I could say Yahweh because he'll, the Holy Spirit intercedes for me in trance. This is what he said. Are you, are you understanding this? Now, this is really the last statement. Three things should be in play when you understand what it is to worship God. Number one, the fear of the Lord. That means reverence. When I was in the Southern Baptist Convention, they had put on the webpage Reverend Dan Reed, and I called him and I said, take that off. There's only one that's reverent. I never call a man reverend. God is reverent. So you see and have a reverence and a fear that's a respect of God. Number two, you need an awe of God. I like it. That's another one of those words that's awe. Oh. You have an awe of God. He moves you. You look at him and go, I have no words. You lay prostrate. You bend your knee. You shut up. And you just put yourself in his presence because there are no words. There really aren't. And then the final one, which is the one I, I am so grateful for, and that is the love of God. The more he has shown me in my life how to love him, the more I have experienced what it is to be loved by him. And that's why when I read the Old Testament, I don't see a God of wrath and judgment. I see a God of mercy. It's why when I see he says to me that I am both the one who brings calamity and blessing, I don't see a mean God. I see a God that I can trust. Because the love aspect of it is everything. And you're not going to know how to love him until you first fear him and have an awe of him and are drawn to spend time with him in his word. Wow, that was a good ending, God. Yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, let's pray ourselves out. I hope, uh, I hope you're motivated. I, I hope you remember this the next time you're thinking about your Lord. I hope you remember to worship not just at church. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you were sufficiently glorified today. I pray that your people that are sitting here now and that are online, those at other churches, Lord, I pray that 
uh, to the best of our abilities that we worship and that we brought glory to your word and to your name. Lord, I, I am so grateful for your affection, your forgiveness, the fact that you are. I'm grateful that the plan is in play. So, Lord, I pray that you would bless us with more of your presence in our lives, that we would have greater wisdom and understanding and knowledge of who you are and why you should be worshipped above all names. And we ask this according to that name. Amen. Next week, we're going to look at some other stuff in reference to worship. I think the... I think we're going to look at, um, I don't know yet. I want to look at why Satan hates it so much. So next week, I think that's what we're going to cover. Why is there such a resistance? So good night. Drop the mic. Yeah, good evening.